Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to today's show. I'm super excited today because we're going to be talking to my good friend, Jim Young, who I have known now for, I guess, about 10 or 15 years. Jim is actually my CPA. Uh, at, that's his day job here in Charlotte, North Carolina. But Jim is somebody that I've always admired as somebody that just, um, he has big dreams and he gets after it. He's somebody that gets wind of an idea and then uh, uses that wind to fill his sails and travel into adventure. So I had to use that little metaphor there because um, Jim, Jim has actually, uh, just this past year, his dream was to own a sailboat and uh, he decided to go big. So why not buy a sailboat in another country? Uh, how about Greece? And, and then move there and live on the boat for a few months and see what life is like there. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and uh, I'm really excited about it. So, Jim, welcome to the campfire. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, we've known each other since, I think, 08. Um, probably. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. Coming up on uh, almost, well, 14 years now. So, um, yeah, Jim, like just for listeners, can you just tell us a little bit about you and, and kind of your day job and your life here in Charlotte? Sure. Yeah, I'm... I'm uh, 58 year old CPA, I've got two kids and um, I'm divorced. And uh, um, so being a tax accountant primarily um, and just the way I've structured work, I'm, I've got a lot of free time ability to take off during the summer. So I like to travel a lot and have always been, you know, a fan of sailing and interested in sailing and taking the American Sailing Association courses and all. And always had the idea, oh, I'm going to buy a boat. I'm going to buy, you know, the dream, buying a boat. I own one once. And, of course, the happiest day was when you sell it. And um, <laughs> and anyway, the dream sort of started building again. Oh, I want to buy a boat. I want to buy a boat. And um, uh, we did a share down in Charleston. But really, you know, weren't, I, I, you know, I wasn't that skilled. but skilled enough to bear boat charter and things. But I got this idea of uh, buying a boat and um, wanting to sail in the Mediterranean. And... Um, it's actually uh, harder to sail from the U.S. back to Europe and from then from Europe to the U.S. And so the idea in my mind, sort of the natural idea seemed to be to buy the boat in Europe and sail it all around the Mediterranean, get that experience in and then sail it back to the U.S. And um, uh, so anyway, so I, I really wasn't going to do it. I started talking to friends and they were all like, oh, that's so cool. You really have to do that, you know, and then. Uh, and then being divorced and single was, you know, hard to uh, um, work out how you're going to buy a 38 foot boat or, you know, a larger boat that's going to require two people to operate. And um, uh, so, of course, I got cabin fever very badly, um, as we all did in 2020. And, and that's that's how it all sort of started rolling along. Cabin fever, not on the boat, but cabin fever here, wanting to to get over there to to make this thing happen. Yeah, I think I think that was <laughs> probably one reason I did such a sort of in retrospect maybe a crazy thing. Um, well, uh, but uh, yeah, cabin fever with COVID and being stuck inside in 2020, yeah. and um, just starting to dream. And then you know, if you, if people asked you what you were like thinking about doing and then getting positive feedback and saying, well, you know, and then, and then what really, I guess, sealed the deal was uh, when my nephew wanted to go for, um, uh, you know, up to a couple of months with me over there. And so then it, it really made it something possible to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> It's just such an exceptional thing. Take us through this. I mean, how do you kind of turn something like this from a dream into a reality? Like, what are some of the steps that you had to take to to find the boat? And, you know, and, and why Greece? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, good questions. Um, 
I think um, to find the boat really wasn't all that uh, difficult because if you're looking for, you know, 28 foot and larger sailboats, uh, you know, maybe 28 to whatever, 100 feet or something, you know, you're going to um, yachtworld.com is is the is like the MLS listing service of boats. Gotcha. Um, there's a lot of them out there, but if it's if it's out there, it's often on Yacht World. And um, uh, so I just started looking on there and then I started looking in the Mediterranean and I, I, I wanted to go see a boat in um, Turkey. And but then that ended up being sold. So, um, yeah. So, so I wanted to go see the boat in Turkey that I saw on Yacht World and I started talking to the broker, but then it it sold pretty quickly. And um, and then I wanted to see a boat in Sicily. And again, it was going to sell very quickly. And uh, and then being so far away and, and just sort of sending out, you know, inquiries about boats was hard to get. You know, I wasn't getting a lot of attention from brokers and I, I didn't really want to work with, you know, find a broker and start looking for a boat through him. I was just more wanted to respond to the ads. So I, I started doing, uh, I started like basically almost making an offer when I would write the broker and say, well, I really like the boat. Um, you know, you're asking 165,000, would he take 145, you know, because I'm, I'm getting ready to buy one, you know, and then that would really move things along with the, the you know, the talking about the boat and everything. And so that happened with this boat in, um, in Athens, Greece, and of course, Greece is, you know, really an optimal place to sail. It's, it's like the Caribbean with, you know, a thousand islands, well, hundreds of islands anyway, to, within that you can sail in between and, you know, warm waters and all. And um, uh, so, you know, it just kind of worked out. And then, and then as I was like looking for boats, I was talking to my nephew and he bought in and, you know, committed to going. And so then next thing I know, I'm figuring out how to wire money to, uh, to Athens, Greece for, <laughs> to put down the, you know, $15,000. So, so you saw, you talked about, like, you said you wanted to go see a boat in, in Turkey and you wanted to go see a boat. Like, were you planning to like physically go look at it before you buy it? Or did this all happen sight unseen? You know, I was, I, yeah, I was kind of thinking like, oh, I'll have to go over there and look at the boat and, and figure this all out. And um, uh, but then, you know, as, as sort of figuring, you know, having it wanting to use it that summer and all, it, it sort of became clear that, you know, I wasn't going to fly all the way over there. And with COVID, you know, just to look at a boat, I was going to, you know, select the boat, uh, uh, figure everything I could about, it, you know, and put a deposit down probably even or or get into contract with it at least and then and then go go and look at it so that's what happened with Athens and uh I was pretty you know I was I was 90 percent sure it was it was you know was just like in the pictures and uh had a good discussion with the broker and got to you know call them several times and chatted with them because I kind of realized that you know I was sending off fifteen thousand dollars or something and you know, no way to get that back if, if it didn't work out. So I just realized I needed to talk to him quite a bit over the phone before I did right. that. So I love, I I got, I got some, yeah, I got some referrals from him as well. So that was good. You said I was 90% sure it was going to be what I thought it was. So I, you know, clearly there's like a level of risk that it might not be, but you know, you, it sounds like you just, you know, you understood that and were willing, willing to take that chance. Yeah. And I talked to the, the broker was great because Athens is a huge, um, charter market. And uh, so he had a lot of U.S. customers or several U.S. customers who were re repeat customers. And so he put me in touch with uh, a, 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 a developer of the construction guy over in Knoxville who's used him all the time. And um, that guy was very, very helpful. And so were a few others. So I, I had a very good uh, comfort level. And he, the broker had been on the boat. And um, uh, the, the boat actually was owned by a, a dual citizen American Greek guy in Athens, a dentist. And um, uh, that ended up being really great when I got, got there because uh, we we ended up having a lot in common because he'd grown up here as well, you know, and everything. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, so, so, get, so getting getting to the boat the first day, though, was was it was a, a huge, huge relief that it was in as good a shape as I thought it would be and that everything looked look good, you know, and it was extremely well cared for. Maybe. Yeah. So talk. So, so talk okay. me through that. So you got there and you felt that sense of relief because it 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 turned out it actually was what you thought you were getting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, 
uh, so I, I flew into Athens International Airport and I got a taxi and got, you know, probably completely ripped off on the price, but got way out in the suburbs of Athens, uh, uh, northwest of Athens. The boat was in a smaller town, kind of a, a cheaper place to keep it. And so I got out in the middle of nowhere and got on this boat and um, uh, the the owner met me there and he was a, he was a very nice guy and really taken it was that, that boat was the love of his life so he'd taken every care of it so it was really nice to get on it and 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 see that and um uh and then i ended up spending like a week um probably 20 hours a week with this this former owner on it and um uh, uh and then we switched into stage two which was the greek bureaucracy of closing uh-huh. on the boat which is unbelievable <laughs> we'll talk, so, so it had been a uh, that. yeah it had been a charter boat before so and and uh so you had that complication because uh it was coming out of sort of a lot of people when boats are chartered they don't pay the vat tax when they buy it and so when they sell it there's a, all these tax issues that come up. And um, so the former owner had to work that out. He'd used the boat personally, but he also sort of had a charter business in addition to his dental practice. It was kind of his avocation, I guess. Yeah. And um, uh, so we started down this road and um, the broker, of course, is like, well, it may take a couple of weeks. And, you know, well, it took like it took like four or five, I think, in the end to get everything straightened out. And um, Greece is a uh it's an interesting place um there's a lot of there's a lot of side money trading hands and the funniest part was going into a government office um where someone in our party it wasn't me but someone in our party would have an envelope with 500 dollars euros and we'd meet with the federal clerk <laughs> and hand him the money the envelope and he would take it and he would throw it in his open briefcase on the side <laughs> of his desk <laughs> wow. several times, several times. And so that ended up expediting the whole thing. They call it the, uh, I think they call it a speed tax. It's what wow. the Greeks call it. And uh, yeah, so anyway, so anyway speed we closed tax. on the boat and speed tax, yeah, and got the paperwork. And um, and one thing that's funny is I bought the boat, boat uh, that for free, which is a 24% tax, which could be, you know, like $40,000 or something. So I didn't pay that, but I have to export it to Turkey to get out of the European Union. And I wasn't able to do that last summer because of COVID. So I have to go back this summer and do that. And so right now the boat is on the hard outside of Athens, but it's it's unsellable. And so I, I do I do get a chuckle because... If I die, the boat's worth, you know, I, I should get like 100000 150000 maybe out of it. But if I die, the boat can't be sold until it's taken to Turkey and back to Athens. So wow. I get a chuckle when I think about what my daughters would do if I die. And I'm pretty sure they just said, well, let's just leave the boat over. You know, let's not let's not deal with that. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's I, I, don't, I, I want to hear about that, because that, I, for some reason, I thought that you, when you got when you came back, you had sold the boat. So it's it's yours and it's still over there. Yeah, kind of unfortunately, because um, what I found it was it was I had a wonderful experience sailing with my um, nephew and my other brother was over there quite for for about three months. But he was like he would be on the boat for three days and then he'd disappear for a week. You know, so that wasn't right either. But wonderful experience sailing with them. But then um, after they left, I ended up. Uh, having to really rely on um, hiring charter captains and uh, also had a, a cancellation, which hurt. I had two friends who were going to come over for, for about uh, two weeks with me and, and they just got worried with COVID and, uh, and maybe stressed out with, maybe I shared too much about the hardships of being on the boat. But um, uh, so, so I just decided, you know, it was, it was just too hard to juggle it as a, as a single person and waiting right. for a crew and all. And um, uh, you really need two people on the boat to operate or you need to be in a marina docked. And um, so that that became a bit of an issue. And so by the end of the summer, I think I by September, I decided, well, you know, I think I'm gonna have to, I'll just get the boat to Turkey this coming summer and back to Athens and then I'll, I'll probably just sell it. Whereas my original plan out there was maybe to sell it back to the US and um, 
I, I probably would still want to do that if I had the crew, but also things have heated up at work. So I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to, I think I'm going to sell it this summer. So in sailing, September. sailing from Greece back to the U S is, is, uh, still a possibility, but, but, uh, questionable at this point. I'd love to do it, but I, I would need a good, you know, a good, a good co co-pilot to, to do it with, um, uh, or co-owner and, um, uh, and I may even still have done it on my own just to, you know, go on me together, uh, paid and crew and friends. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, um, my partner at work, David, he, he may be kind of striking out on his own, which is going to really cut into my ability to take a three month vacation, yeah. you know? Gotcha. So, yeah. Well, so Jim, okay. so kind of, we got through sort of the logistics of like acquiring the boat and obviously that was a process, but how, so how long were you over there in total from, from, uh, from start to finish? Oh boy. Uh, I was, I lived on that boat 85 days and um, 85 days about 85 days. Yes. About three yeah. months. And, um, and I was over there maybe two weeks longer than that. But, um, yep. uh, uh, one frustration was about 20 of the days were by myself. And, um, uh, that was a bit frustrating, especially down in the Cyclades in, you know, the Mykonos Santorini world and all the other okay. famous island access. But one frustration down there is they don't really have marina facilities. The marinas tend to fill up with locals boats. And yeah. so it was, it was very hard to like leave the boat somewhere, you know, most of the, um, most of the harbors down there are um, just towns where you pull into the port and you back up to the town key or K, however you want to say that. And, you know, you med more with your anchor and then you tie the back of the boat up to the concrete, um, you know, the concrete on the sidewalk Nick, where yeah. across the street are all the shops. And you can't really, I mean, you can leave the boat to go to dinner, but you, 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 it's definitely not recommended to leave it overnight. So I was, I was really uh, tied into that boat. Um, and, uh, you know, which would have been fine, but it would have been better. There, there were like three weeks by myself. And so that kind of convinced me that dealing with that, I was kind of like, well, you know, this may not be, this is, this is a logistical uh, problem. In fact, it's funny looking back on it because I was talking to my older brother who spent a lot of time on the boat with me and there weren't really that many close calls sailing, you know, none really. I mean, we were scared at times because we were, you know, out in the middle of the ocean with the, the Maltemi is like the 30 knot wind you get every three weeks there. And, you know, you'd, you'd be there with six foot waves with no sight of land and, you know, it would be a little worrisome at times, but there was nothing where it felt like a close call. But for me, much more of the 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 challenge was the oh boy in five days you know i'm gonna be by myself and i gotta get a get this thing into a marina you know mm -hmm. um i can't be anchored out because you know that's really kind of dangerous by yourself and i really don't want to be at a town key because if the anchor starts slipping and i have to pull the boat back out and redo it you know i'm, I'm gonna have to get some help you know to do that and um so it was, it was more, it was more that it was more the logistics of it all. And then yeah, also this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I, I heard you talking about. I mean, it's just so interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't really like any of the, the fear of the, of the natural side or just like being out on the open water that was scary too. It was more just like the logistical stuff, but yeah. Um, you know, I want to, I want to touch on, you said you did talk about the, the natural piece you know, the 30 knot winds, the six foot waves. And you said there was some times when you were scared. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, uh, the first time was, um, we, you know, I, I spent quite a bit of time and became good friends with the former owner, Stephen, and I went with him and his son and his son's friends out into the Saronic Gulf, which is all within about 150 miles of, of, of Athens. And it's the islands around Athens and they're, exceedingly beautiful, but pretty light winds for the most part, you know, maybe, maybe 10, 15 knot winds, you know, and, and then you're like, wow, this is great, you know, but then you get down to the Cyclades and it's more like the trade winds, the British Virgin Islands, except they have a, um, uh, a northerly wind, they call it the Meltemi in the summer between July and September. And every two to three weeks, it blows at about 30 plus knots and generates, you know, very big waves. Um, and, 
so I guess we were in the Saronic and um, my crew, which was my nephew and a friend of his and my brother, insisted the first week that we went on our own that I hire a, a, a charter captain to help us. And um, which I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I didn't think we needed it. But um, anyway, we did that for a week and then we were going to get into the Cyclades and we were dropping the captain and the former owner of my boat was like, are you kidding? There's really high winds down there. You can't do that. You, you know, and so everybody was like scaring us, you know, yeah. Cyclades. And so we headed down there and we passed the point, um, which is there's a Poseidon, a 3,500-year-old uh, uh, temple to Poseidon right on the final point. And then you go out into the open ocean down into the, and you're out of sight of land. And and, uh, and it, it, I think the Metemi, Metemi had passed maybe or something, but there were still like these huge waves and it, the cockpit was very wet. And um I was pretty much okay though. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't that scared at that point, but also what I found is that it depends on who's on the boat with you because later we did that same experience about um, two months later or a month and a half later with my daughter and her boyfriend. And then I was much more fearful. And I think mm. it is because I didn't want anything to happen to her, you know, Ooh, about her, so we yeah. got it out in the middle and, you know, and, and got back into it. But, um, uh, you know, that, that was great. And, um, we had great navigation though. It's, you know, with the technology today, you just have a screen where you're looking at your path on the boat and everything. And, um, so, so, you so, know, it's, so it's, 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 it's not that scary to do it as long as you don't go out and really crazy. There were, there were several times we stayed in, you know, because of the, the wind. Yeah. What's so. the root of the fear, Jim? Like what's, what are you worried about happening? Oh, well, as I got to know the boat, my my main fear was um, the the boat is a, a broad blue catamaran. It's a lot like a lagoon, but it relies a little more on the um, the jib, the Genoa for 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 power. It's got a huge Genoa, and my main fear was putting that Genoa up and um, having the wind kick up to to you know over thirty knots, and then just it's so hard to get that thing in when when you have a lot of wind, especially if you somehow end up with just the Genoa and not the mainsail up to blanket it. And so that was, as I got to know the boat, that was like the main issue with it in my mind. And, um, well, so what happens if you so can't, that was always a fear familiar, for people that aren't familiar. What, I mean, what hap what could happen if you couldn't get it in? Well, I mean, you can't stop. <laughs> so you'd have to drop it. And, uh, I had never like put the sails up on that boat because it's on a roller furrow, so it's permanent. So I wasn't even really sure which line would drop the Genoa down, you know, or it would just get torn up, you know, and be extremely expensive. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the issue would be, you know, you need to get the sail down to stop. And, um, you know, could you do that if, it, if the wind was, was strong enough? Um, yeah. So that, that, that was, that was a big fear. And then just, things breaking were, um, uh, you know, it's an older sailboat, it's 07. And so I think after you get past 10 years or so, things start to go. And so we had the water pump break on us like three times. And um, that's really terrible because then you, you don't have running water in the kitchen sink, you can't shower, you know, all that. And then, and then another time we had uh, one of the engines, catamarans so that has two engines and one of the engines, um, uh, stopped um being able to uh go into reverse i guess or yeah i think i or even go into idle and so that was that was very stressful because you know when you go into dock you really need a lot of maneuverability in these little towns sure. marinas and yeah so i mean is there so, but, was there um, any was there any fear of getting stuck out there well you know, as someone told me when I was learning to sail is, is you really, you really can't get stranded in a sailboat because you have, you know, the sail and then you have yeah. an engine. So, you know, you've, you have complete backup. And so, uh, no, I never really had a fear of that. And the, the boat was like really solid. It's, you know, a yeah. really solid piece of plastic that is always going to float and it's catamaran. So they're, you know, other than maybe falling apart in a hurricane or something, they, they, they really shouldn't sink because they don't have a keel on them. So, yeah. so I didn't feel that so much. Um, and being out of sight of land was 
not too big a deal because you know you've you've got the technology down there where you're always on the internet and so you're always getting the gps signal and you're seeing exactly gotcha. you know and it wasn't like we were in the middle of the ocean we would be like 30 miles off away from land you know gotcha. which is yeah. you know on a sailboat it is six hours but it wasn't yeah it wasn't i like, mean it's, oh you know you've got to last for two weeks we're in the middle of the atlantic ocean you know it's still a long way and there's got to be you know i mean we see this kind of stuff in the movies but when you're like really living it and you can't see land and there's just ocean all the way around you i mean there, there's got to be something special about that and so one of the things that we i've talked about with a bunch of the guests on this podcast is i'm i'm a big fan of the word awe and uh, the dictionary definition of the word awe is a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. And I'm just imagining you out on the open ocean, like with kind of these feelings of fear, but you've also got to be just, you've got to be experiencing awe when you're just out there in the middle of, in the middle of the ocean. I'm just wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is great. And the, in the sailboats, sailing along smoothly and beautifully you know and it's all quiet out there um you just have the wind and the sun and the waves and um it is it, it really is very very uh a very lovely experience you know and i, I was very happy with with those experiences because and that's what i was you know wanted with the sailing and um uh what would i say about that it was it was you know seeing seeing the um seeing the wildlife is always fun, you know, if you see a dolphin or something. And, um, so that's always just the huge, huge, yeah, I guess feeling of awe and excitement and, and sea yeah. turtles. We saw some of those, um, uh, and, and really, you know, um, uh, I think just being in Greece and the history of it all. And, um, this may be a little less of the adventure aspect, but, um, you know, but coming into a town like um, Armopolis, which is the capital of the Cyclades, it's on, what island is it on? I forget, Syros, I think. Anyway, which is a bigger city, or it looks like a bigger city built up. And coming on the, out into that on a boat is is just spectacular. You know, it really is, it really is a lot of fun. And you just can't believe you're there and in Greece. And then, um, yeah. Is the color of the water just like you see on all the pictures? Was it Was it that beautiful? It, it is beautiful. It's um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword in the Mediterranean and Greece. The, the water is crystal clear. In fact, um, we had one experience where um, uh, we dropped a oar into about 26 feet or 25 feet of water. And it was so crystal clear, we could look down and see it under the boat. And we really needed it back because our dinghy engine wasn't working and we were stuck at anchor for several days until we could get into a marina. And... Yeah. Um, and so we're, it was just tying us uh, 25 feet below, but you could see it crystal clear. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and there's a lot of colorful fish. They're generally smaller fish in Greece mm -hmm. and the Mediterranean. And, um, uh, but um, I think technically what happens with the Mediterranean there is it's like a big lake. It doesn't, get, it doesn't have tides because other waters don't get into it very well, except at maybe Gibraltar and a little bit at the Red Sea. And so because of that, it has less microbes and it's crystal clear, but because less microbes, there's also a little bit less life in it. So okay. there's less fish, certainly less big fish and less dolphins and sharks and things than there would be in the Caribbean. But the great side of that is you can be anchored anywhere in like, you know, 20 or 30 feet of water and you can just jump right in the water. You don't even have to think about sharks because there really aren't. Yeah, they it's just beautiful. Don't exist that so, much over there. It's overfished too, probably. But, so did you get but, did you get the ore back? We did. In fact, I, I was very proud of myself. I I read up on um uh, free diving and um uh started thinking about you know how can I do this? And then I started practicing and there's there's a technique for like you lose a lot of your energy when you're at the surface and you start to dive. So there's a technique to duck into the dive and get down there. And then there's 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 various techniques, and so I kind of practiced that for for a day, and then the next day went down there, and uh, I was I had two Greek friends who stayed after the um, they were actually been friends of the captain, but I got stuck without being able to get a marina, so they were staying. They were very nice, and they had put together this 
they one of them you, well anyway i won't get into that but they put together this contraption which was like 10 feet long to try to get it but it never worked so i just practiced free driving diving and then i actually made it down um to the 25 feet down and, and got it and back i up. love I that I mean, that's just like a journey in itself. Like, like just, I can, I just picturing you out there on that boat, like teaching yourself how to free dive. And then, you know, finally you, you must've felt pretty good when you finally got your hands on that thing. I did. It was scary going down that far. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, I was so happy when I got back up. None of us could believe we got it back. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. amazing. So I, th this whole experience, it just sounds like such a, such a great life experience. And, and Jim, I know, um, I know that you've been on lots of adventures. I know that, uh, that you and your family moved to, to China for an entire year. I know like some of the other adventures that you've been on and it's, it's just really inspiring because you've always been somebody that just kind of get, gets an idea and then just runs with it. Um, I, I'm just, I think it's great. And I'm curious, like if you remember, like what was the first sort of big adventure that you took? that sort of triggered the rest of these adventures, this sort of a, this love for adventure that you have? Well, we took the family to China for a year in 2012. So that was pretty big, you know, and, and getting the kids in school over there and finding housing and all. And, uh, but before that, probably, um, I don't know, I guess some trips to Europe, maybe I took when I was, when I was, um, in my twenties, you know, I went one summer by myself actually. And, um, so that kind of, all that kind of building blocks, you know, prepared me to, to, to do this. And, um, uh, so, yes. so yeah. what, what is it like, if you ask yourself, like, what, what is it that sort of calls you? Like, what, what is it that calls you to adventure? Oh, well, you know, I think I just maybe just get bored, you know, and, and start like thinking, you know, you know, I should do this or have an interest in like I was interested in China because we have two adopted Chinese kids and they were learning Chinese. And and then you just kind of dig into it and say, oh, you know, that would be really cool, you know, to, to go live there and, and work there and and, um, you know, remotely. And, um, uh, you know, how could that work? And um, and and then and then you, you you find a relocation company, you know, and you tell them, well, we're just a family of four. We're not a company, but we want to relocate. Can you take yeah. care of everything? They're like, yes. And you're like, well, okay, this, this, this would work, you know? This is yeah. Work. So like for, for yeah. a lot of these trips, like the Greece trip, the China trip, I mean, and some of your other trips too, like for you, I know like they, they start as ideas. It's like, oh, you know, I mean, and you mentioned it being out of boredom, but like you get these ideas in these states of boredom, but you know, a lot of people um, w miss that link between the idea and then actually turning it into reality. Like for you, what is that? Like, what, what's that connection piece that, that helps you get from the idea to like actually getting after it and doing it? Oh, well, probably, you know, it's a dream. And so you, you dream, oh, this would be so great. And you can kind of envision yourself on the boat and you, you know, you like boating. And, and so you, you start looking and then, um, uh, you know, it's fun to look at houses or boats or whatever. And, um, uh, and then, and then you start to figure things out and, and it gets kind of fun and you're like, oh, well, this would work this, you know, this would work, this piece fits with this. So this, this would work. And, um, it just kind of, uh, yeah. takes on a life of its own, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What I'm hearing though, is like this sort of sense of optimism and sort of this sense of like, I mean, honestly, I'm hearing kind of like a sense of control. Like, I know I can do this. Like, here, this is this idea. And if I just do this step and then this step, like, this is all going to sort of fall into place. Like, did you, like, for the Greece one in particular, did you have any, like, any, like, sort of second thoughts or doubts or, you know, any part of you that was like, oh, I can't do, you know, like, is there like a voice that's trying to talk you out of it at any point? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because, you know, buying a, you know, $165,000 sailboat in Greece. And then, you know, I, I, I knew it was going to be expensive, you know, they depreciate and then can you find a reseller and everything. So, so, uh, but you know, these things, these adventures, they do, they kind of take on a life of their own because I got over there and it had taken a long time and I had to put down the other $150,000 and buy the boat. And um, I remember thinking like, you know, and I'd already had, you know, this was like four weeks into the adventure. So I already had plenty of sailing and 
some funny time in Greece. Sure. And so, you know, definitely there was a thought in my mind, hey, you know, I could, because because it just took so long with the bureaucracy to close, but the owner, I was sailing with him, you know, and um, the former owner and uh, at least some of the time, you know, we, we went on a week trip, you know, and, and so I'd, I'd gotten some sailing in. And so I was, I was somewhat tempted to just like bail at that point, but they do take on a life of their own because my, my nephew was, was, you know, already there and planning to spend the next eight weeks with me on a boat. And um, so, so, you know, I think you, you kind of realize it's not a financially wise move and, and same thing with China, you know, maybe. And, uh, but, but it's kind of taken on a life of its own. And it, it, the, it, once you sort of start the adventure and pull the, pull the zip rip cord, you're, you're long for the ride in some sense, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes so probably you just, even you just, like, you're... yeah, I mean, you just kind of step into it and, you know, it, like you said, it takes on a life of an, its own and, and, uh, it just becomes, it just becomes the journey. So I guess I'm curious, you're back now and of course the boat's still over there. So maybe this journey hasn't totally ended yet, but <laughs> like Jim, like the person that started yeah. this adventure, how, it, how is, how is Jim different now because of having taken this adventure? Well, I have, I have this great memory of the summer. Um, there was the stress, and I did learn a lot about the problems with doing something like this. But, um, uh, but you know, even I, w- I would definitely not, even for the, even if I, you know, end up losing a lot of money on the boat or whatever, I would, wouldn't take it back. I would do it again because it was it was a great it was a great experience over the summer. I got to know the Greek islands. I got to know, you know, several Greek people real well, and. Um, uh, you know, got to spend time with family. It ended up being a family affair, um, with my nephew and brother and daughter. But, um, uh, I guess, um, for me, um, I know somewhat more about sailing and, um, well, certainly a lot more about sailing in, in Europe and the Med Mooring or specifically Greece, we're in Greece the whole time, the Med Mooring and how that all works. And, um, so that was wonderful because I always had that dream of, of, of sailing around places like that. And that, that really completely, you know, was right, right tuned into what I'd wanted to do with sailing from Island to Island and figuring all that out. And, um, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, it was, it was, it was another adventure. It's an adventure that's still ongoing because I still do on the boat. So I'm going back and, july i think with my niece actually this time and maybe another daughter and um and hopefully some friends and sailing it to turkey and back to athens yeah, that um, sounds amazing. so yeah, yeah I, I think you know i just feel like i really got to know greece i got to know parts of the world over there really very very well really you know yeah it's that's so, amazing it's it and nice. it's so- so beautiful someplace I hope to go at some point. So, so Jim, like for people that are listening, like what advice would you have for, for people that have gotten these kinds of ideas? And like a lot of people would say, you know, that's a harebrained idea. I'm I'm never going to be able to do that, but you're somebody that's actually like taken action and actually, you know, put the wheels in motion. Like what advice would you have for people that are listening that have had a dream to do something like what you've done, but just haven't, haven't been able to pull the trigger? Um, well, you know, if you can, if you can, if you can work it out, um, financially and time wise, you know, then, then, uh, I think, I think pulling the trigger, you know, is, is, a, is a, a, a good move. And, and, you know, there are, you know, I mean, yeah, I, th- I think people probably could be, a lot of people could, you know, they're dreaming of doing something like this, but then they don't do it. And I think a lot of them probably could uh, do it. It's, I guess it's a, it's a mix of problems and, and, and joy of going and doing it. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, if, if you're really enjoying something, the problems become part of the, the interesting part of it too, you know, of, of, of figuring all that out. And, um, so, you know, I, I think, I think there's all these adventures are, are within reach and there's, there's resources out there helping, helping you to be able to do that. Um, whether it's, it's boating with, uh, 
the resource to buy boats, maintain boats, and have, you know, hire people to help you with the boats, or uh, whether maybe, you know, some of your guests are like avid hikers, and there's resources to get them up Everest or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is, uh, you know, maybe start with a little bit of research and just start doing your homework and seeing where it takes you. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then, um, uh, yeah, they do tend to take on a life of their own then as you start figuring things out and saying, well, I'm going to do this and this. And of course, once you, uh, once you actually start spending money, then you're, it really takes on a life of the year of its own and you're, you're hooked into it, you know, and you're going to do it. But, uh, of course we all have adventures, whether we, if we stay home, I, if I'd stayed home, I would have done something different. Um, so that might've been great too, but, um, I think, getting to the Greek islands and doing the sailing dream and sort of meeting that, that thing that I thought about for years was, was very satisfying. And so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I did it. So I, I would say if you've been thinking about doing something for, for 10 years, then, you know, maybe that's long enough where you should go and do it. You know, I'm, it's time to get after it. Well, Jim, like this, this was such an amazing adventure for you. And I know that at some point they're going to make a movie about this, this, this whole situation of, of Jim Young going <laughs> over and buying a boat and living out over there. And so, so my first question is when they do, when they make this movie in Hollywood, is it going to be a drama or a comedy? Oh, a little of both, but there's always a lot of comedy in these things. Um, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the government employee in Greece who was you know, taking speed tax from us. And, um, uh, so, so I would say, a, a comedy drama, kind of like a, a comedy for the most part. And then, and then when you get to the logistics, it's, or, or like a, a dicey situation, it turns into a, a bit of a drama, but hopefully never too much, hopefully never like a disaster, like that fishing boat disaster or something, you know? <laughs> well, so who's going to be the actor, the Hollywood actor that plays Jim Young? Yeah, I thought about that because you mentioned that. And I was like, a, I like, a, what is it, Kino Reeves, you know, but he's, he's oh, Keanu so Reeves cool. Gonna and, play. I love uh, it. Yeah. For, for, for that. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, uh, so um, probably, you know, Tom Hanks has uh, his wife is partly Greek. So it, it probably would be something like somebody like that. Probably. More. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Tom Hanks. He's got a house and Jim. in New York. So. Yeah. And uh, what's your movie going to be called? Oh, hmm. I don't know. Oh, Grecian sailing. I, I don't know. I don't have anything on that. <laughs> Grecian, Greek Grecian sailing, sailing um, starring Tom Hanks. And uh, it's Greek. a drum. It's a drum com. I love it. Well, um, Jim, this has been yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story. And for those that are listening, I really hope that you've been inspired as much as I have. I hope that Jim's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. And so if you have a story to tell or you need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thank you so much for listening. And Jim, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Scott.